get started with a little bit of preamble. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Merci beaucoup pour, pour nous rejoindre ce matin. Um, I would like to, uh, well, I guess I'll introduce myself first. My name is Leslie Godry. I am the tourism coordinator for SEDEM. And we have uh, the tourism sector within SEDEM is one sector. SEDEM is the Francophone Economic Development Agency for bilingual municipalities. Um, and we have, Irina, correct me, 15 member municipalities. And then within the tourism sector, we also support, um, support and promote Francophone tourism, Francophone and Mét Francophone and Métis tourism, sorry, and Francophone and Métis um, entrepreneurs as well. So sometimes we might have a few uh, Francophone or, or Métis uh, entrepreneurs that aren't necessarily within that geographic membership base, but we assist um, with tourism development, destination development, marketing and promotion, and some training. Um, we had thought on the tourism side of things. We know that a lot of um, of our communities have these beautiful parks and we really feel like they're these little gems or larger gems in some of the larger parks um, that are maybe underutilized. Um, they are definitely an asset for our communities and for our as a and consider our parks as a tourism asset. So <clears throat> excuse me, we started this initiative enhancing your parks to really help set the stage for people to start thinking about their parks as an asset. Um, and if they want to invest in their parks, how do they go about it? What are the good things that you can look for? Um, how to, what to consider when you're planning? Um, and all kinds of little tips and tricks that I'm sure Darcy and Jane will, will talk about. Um, I just wanted to also introduce Irina is our marketing and communications director and uh, has very much helped us out on with all of our marketing and communications for tourism. Uh, Darcy Granov is Granov, sorry, is um, owner and uh, owner and operator, uh, chief officer, <laughs> all the fun titles of Little Blue Stem Landscape Architecture and Jane Hilder is also a landscape architect working with um, Darcy. So with that, I think I would like to turn it over to um, Darcy and Jane. But just before that, I'll just let Irina say a word or two if there's any housekeeping issues. Sure, so um, still, there's a, still a few people joining us. So bonjour tout le monde, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so yes, if you wanna, it's up to you if you wanna keep your video on or not. I don't know, Darcy, if you have a preference. Um, whatever you feel like, however you feel, uh, you know, however you feel, so whether it's on or off, but please do make sure that your uh, microphone is muted at all, at all times. And Darcy, would you rather have the, the questions during your presentation or at the end? Yeah, so we have a few opportunities for questions and we'll um, hopefully use chat during, during the presentation, but um, yeah. Perfect. So I'll be able to monitor the chat and if there are questions that do pop up, uh, I can ask them to you if you'd like. Excellent. And so, yeah, anyone can feel free to just put your uh, question, can be in French or English. Uh, and if it's in French, we'll just translate it. That's no problem. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Thanks. Excellent. Well, good morning. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Un grand merci à CEDEM. Thank you very much for inviting us to share our expertise on enhancing your parks. We have a, a very friendly group of participants, so I hope you will uh, share some of your experiences from all over the province today. I see a few clients, a few friends. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Clayton, nice to see you all. Um, and we hope that, like I said, questions you can ask in terms of etiquette, hopefully we can keep muted unless you are talking and uh, ask questions as they arise in the chat. And we will have a question and answer period at the end. Uh, as you have seen, the session is recorded and CDAM will be sharing it with participants and uh, help facilitate sort of follow-up questions. 
So we are presenting today from Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, the importance of this acknowledgement runs really deep, especially through this ongoing journey of reconciliation. Here at LBLA, anything we do on the landscape, we are mindful of future generations and all relations. And with our presentation topic today on enhancing your parks, I wanted to mention a very important and newly des designated UNESCO World Heritage Site on Treaty 5 in Manitoba here, Pimachuawin Aki, uh, which means the land that gives life. And I do apologize, my Anishinaabe Moen is not, not up to par, nor my French, but give me, give me some grace there. <laughs> This place is so diverse and it really celebrates and embodies both cultural and natural heritage values and all of the creator's gifts. So when we use the term land reconciliation, we believe that enacting reconciliation involves seeking education, understanding and taking action to avoid repeating history and ensuring human rights and all relations are preserved and respected now and for future generations. So in direct, direct relation to parks, natural spaces and also learning in nature, we acknowledge that the Indigenous people of Manitoba and North America have been providing land-based education to their children for centuries due to the history of colonialism and residential schools, the traditional land-based teachings of this system has been systematically disrupted. So we do encourage every project to start in a good way by working with elders and knowledge keepers. Um, this also ensures that the water, rock, plants, soil, and animals will be protected for future generations down the line. So just a little snippet about our firm, Little Blue Stem Landscape Architecture, or LBLA, located here in Treaty 1. Uh, we've designed spaces throughout the province and beyond. We often work with community stakeholders, whether it's on park design, schoolyards, commercial properties, playgrounds, streetscapes. Uh, we've also done a lot of uh, recreational trail systems and outdoor play spaces. We believe firmly that community engagement is key to long-term success of landscape projects. And so we utilize the values and principles from the International Association of Public Participation or the IAP2. So as previously mentioned, the team that we have here today are myself, uh, Darcy and Jane Hilder who's actually a landscape designer, but working her way towards becoming a landscape architect. Uh, I would also love to hear more about who is here. So if you're willing to share your name and organization or community you represent in the chat, that would be amazing. Let's see Yvonne, we just saw you recently. Few more people are just popping in as yeah, well. Yeah, a few more people are still joining us, and uh, okay. they do. Some people do have it in their name, so I see Beausjour, um, Municipality of Alexander, um, la Compagnie de la Vérendrie, Clayton, Arm of West Interlake, uh, Daniel from CDC Taché. Well, bienvenue. Welcome, everyone. Town of Carberry. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Good all diversity over of people. <laughs> yeah. And Jenny representing tourism as always. All right. So really an overview of today's webinar. We're going to be going through three different parts. Uh, first, we will be discussing the elements to create successful park design. And this really requires a few checklists, some big picture perspectives, but we will also be spending time reviewing more site-specific considerations that give place-based design meaning. 
then we will focus on individual experiences within parks, within the park spaces. So really each site that we design or visit is unique and it comes with unique opportunities and challenges. But there are a few consistent elements that we consider right from the beginning that really help to create beautiful and functional spaces. So place-based design considerations can benefit both locals and visitors alike. So I'm sure everyone has heard location, 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 but it certainly is a critical element to consider the users of the park, the community needs, how uh, close it is to things, so proximity and access to this space. It should all be uh, located very well to help uh, establish a really central location. Also planning for accessibility and inclusion. So we want the most amount of people of various abilities to have easy access to beautiful spaces. So therefore a central, well-connected location is desirable for people of all age ranges. So it's important to think um, and consider topography, the land, the water, the soil. Are they suitable for the uses or the proposed developments? Also the proximity to infrastructure. Let's be real, cost is always a factor in these things. So if you do want hydro and water uh, running to the site, being closer makes it more affordable to do those things. It's also critical to celebrate the assets that the park space has, whether that's through celebrating views, the vistas, or even key destination, whether it's a natural feature in the park or maybe artwork to highlight. The population base from communities can support and animate the space as well as provide eyes on the space. And this is really important to promote security in the park. So being well connected to community has multiple benefits. Finally, organizing things spatially, delineating space for key activities. You wanna think about recreation, uh, key amenities that are key to each park location. So areas should be designated for active recreation, nature reserve areas, bike and parking areas, or even staging areas. Nature is critical in parks and green spaces. So while central location is key, it's also really important to consider locating designs in places that enhance existing natural features. Incorporating these living systems, forests, prairies, and wetlands with the trees and plants wherever possible, not only improves species habitat and diversity, but also can offer shade to visitors of the park and create a visual experience in being in the park. Um, there is certainly something to be said when something's defined by nature, it really welcomes you to the space. The next thing is the seating amenities. So to make your space accessible, including includes offering lots of seating choices. It makes the space welcoming. It gives you a place to anchor yourself, to pause and to really enjoy, stay and play in the space. So materials should be considered for your space. They're important to add visual interest but also durability and accessibility should be considerations. Something like picnic amenities uh, can also cater to all ages, families, uh, and abilities with the ability to roll up a wheelchair or a stroller uh, or a toddler to access the space. The next element is maintenance and cleanliness. So I would be remiss not to mention this. This is a really critical uh, to provide a good experience over time. So the more you put into taking care of the park, the better. <laughs> and you have to build a reputation for cleanliness. So out of, out of design gate, we will consider maintenance as a part of your budget, knowing that people will wanna come back, use the park. It's clean, well-maintained throughout the season. So this project is actually an 
Ontario, uh, out in Nestor Falls, but includes uh, regular garbage and recycling facilities near all the gathering areas, the play spaces, and it just helps promote uh, people cleaning up after themselves, uh, having those uh, amenities available. There's also some washrooms that are regularly maintained. Um, both the washrooms and garbage cans are protected from wildlife as well as vandalism through regular um, inspections. New construction contracts, which I think is really key for new parks or any kind of park planting projects, should include maintenance as well. So thinking about trees and shrubs, they're growing living things. They need to be watered and weeded, especially through the establishment period in the, in the young life of a tree, making sure they're well rooted and, and can establish well for a, a lifelong um, growth. And unfortunately, vandalism in public spaces is really an inevitable. So choosing durable products that be, can be cleaned from graffiti or repaired is also an important consideration. So play features, any kind of recreational amenity in a park uh, might first bring to mind something like a basketball court or a soccer field, soccer pitches, or play structures, but we would also consider all kinds of sensory experiences or play experiences for diverse users. So oftentimes when we work com with communities, it's the stakeholders, the community folks that will bring up uh, an idea that creates a, an interesting space. And with this information, it might be play equipment or it might be a dog park, which is a need in the community or a splash pad or a nature playground, or a full recreation center. Again, it's important to consider all seasons, how you're going to use this space, as well as all ages and abilities. You want to cater to families and, and people of, of different ages. Next thing is programming. So cultural events, entertainment, this is what draws people to spaces. People will use beautiful spaces year round, but it's wonderful can, when you can make a place for an annual cultural event or a space that people come to for iconic entertainment experiences. You can have a park that is both a concert venue and a place to walk in nature. So place-based design, which is really being inspired by the place that, that is there, not only celebrates the local, but also offers new programming potential for communities. Connectivity and walking paths, sidewalks, whatever you'd like to call them. Good circulation in a public space is one of those hidden elements that can really um, make or break a good experience. So we carefully consider how people of all ages, stages and abilities move around our site, connect to greater community, what the access points are like. And we also develop a variety of walking paths and connections when we're working on a park. So to think about access as well as desire paths. So how people are actually using the space now, where people are wanting to go, how this changes over this seasonal variation. Uh, it also introduces the opportunity of creating new pathway systems like a skating system uh, in the winter months where you can flood out spaces that aren't um, actively used as that in other months. I would also encourage the strategic use of high quality signage. This really helps users as they arrive to the site welcome them. It provides wayfinding so they know where they're going on the site. And it also provides an opportunity for the community to introduce um, little etiquette tips, um, little safety advice, or keep up with the current community trends. Lastly, security. Um, so in a park, you want to create spaces that are safe, that they're visible, and that they can be well monitored. Uh, it, it, those are things are all significant considerations for us, because if people don't feel safe in your park, they won't use it. Uh, and then, you know, illicit activities can can help and we want to avoid that. 
So we wanna create spaces that are inviting and safe for every demographic. So we use SEPTED principles, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And this means strategic placement of lighting, um, maintaining key sight lines. Uh, some places it means installing video surveillance, uh, but that's really up to the individual community and of course budgets as they allow. So now we're gonna dive into the next elements, which are much more site specific. So they're considered really these overarching must haves for public space. However, each and every space is unique and really has its own special attributes to celebrate. Uh, special con conditions maybe to mitigate in order to provide both safety and a pleasurable experience for visiting park space. And these site-specific considerations can change over time. They can also change by the season. So it's just to be mindful of what, what is going on in your space. So some of the physical considerations that exist here in Manitoba uh, include the seasonality, circulation, and the environment. <laughs> in our preamble, we were just chatting about how volatile that can be in Manitoba. Um, and some of the tourism folks in the Zoom I know could also add or can contribute the added layer of information on how travel patterns change over the season um, and over time. Um, I, so eight items, are they in order? It's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't say they're, you can't have maybe all of them in a space uh, or in an order, but yes, I would say sort of starting from important and going down to less important, but honestly, it's also about site-specific design. So what works for your site, I think, Tatiana would, would be my workaround to that question. So generally speaking, yes, they are in order, but I feel like it's like a recipe. What, what fits, what would make, enhance that salad recipe, that salad dressing, what adds the right spice um, to a site really helps uh, place those things. So I'll just go to the next slide. So like I said, each season in Manitoba is unique and very distinctive and year by year, there are many unique shifts in weather patterns and cl climatic conditions. So we have all experienced this volatility. It feels like this year, especially with the flooding. Um, and also the sheer pleasure of Manitoba's climate can bring. There is nothing more joyful than a summer day in the Manitoba prairie. So if truly changes over time and each season, climate change is predicted to increase the severity of these extremes. So it is really important to utilize nature-based solutions like green infrastructure, plan programming in areas that offer shade relief in summer or warm up zones in winter, celebrate the diversity of the seasons from the cherry and apple blossom explosion to the harvest, to the warm grasses dancing in the fall prairie, to the bold pops of color of dogwood contrasted against the snow. These all make uh, these considerations for annual programming special. It allows visitors uh, to come at different times of year and have a very different experience. And these plants and trees local to the region really have distinctive um, blooming seasons and can attract the butterflies uh, and the bees and the pollinators, uh, the birds. This green infrastructure, again, like just having little eco swales, different things in your park can help mitigate the extreme volumes of water. Connecting space also means connecting to the seasons. It truly does. I, I, I really feel sometimes people think parks are only a summer use thing, but it really has to, the thought has to change. You have to think about all four seasons and the opportunities that lie in each of them. So there's a diversity of examples on this page um, from independent activities where people are bringing their own bikes and doing their own programming 
to like programming in parks where there's uh, something throughout the season to create this space activation from bike hubs, birding, gardening clubs, farmers markets, to skiing and skating. From permanent event spaces to pop-up restaurants on the river trail. These are all unique options for recreation and culinary delight and enjoyment in parks and open spaces. So by creating beautiful spaces that connect the park to activities, it really helps bring people, uh, bring enjoyment and have that balanced structure in the space where there's still plenty of room for nature. There's plenty of opportunity for comfort, comfort. Uh, and there's also a multitude of all season use. So circulation systems become really the structural organization of a park site. They're often defined by paved or graveled roadways or pedestrian corridors. However, path of travel can also be led by visual interest. So like that Kodak moment or that selfie moment where people are guided to. It could be vertical elements like a tall rock face or a tall tree. It could be fencing that help direct people to a certain space. There's also control or access points into each site. And those are really critical to establish. Uh, one, because usually you have to get permits through Manitoba infrastructure and do that whole process. Uh, but two, it's really important to connect people from the community in the places where people actually are. Uh, this really helps direct the movement through the site and can provide a sense of arrival. You want to celebrate coming to a space. So really, the way in which visitors move in a park defines their comfort level and their overall experience. So designing circulation means accounting for all different types of movements, transportation and their interactions. So pedestrians on foot could be dog walkers, they could be hikers, they could be you know, walking with strollers, or they could be rollers, whether that's um, on roller skates, blades or uh, skateboards. It can be all different ways of movement. There's also, of course, cyclists, some of which are commuters trying to get through and uh, quickly to a destination. Some are more pleasure riders or riders that are looking for, you know, extreme mountain experiences or hill experiences really here in Manitoba. There's also vehicles. So how they're accessing the site, what routes they're allowed to take and travel on as well as storage, where you put the cars, the ATVs, um, the snowmobiles, as well as the, the bicycles, um, and, and thinking about those spaces and how they're defined. There's also the winter transportation mode, so where we have uh, ice skaters, skiers, um, snowmobilers, as well as snowshoers, and how existing features even in winter can really help define new circulation systems like a groomed ski trail. So circulation can really be more than just physical paths. Main thoroughfares should be clearly defined. And again, I will say with more than just a physical infrastructure, but also with signage. So this is a master plan for a community of Ashern. Uh, Clayton, hope you're okay with us using this. Uh, it demonstrates a layered approach to circulation. Uh, you can see that there's multimodal uh, recreation. So pedestrians, cyclists, ATV users, and snowmobilers are all um, have dedicated circulation systems in this space. Uh, it also introduces the ability to meander, to enjoy the space, to check out the butterflies and the birds, enjoy the natural features like the forests and the wet meadows, and to really have functional circulation and access points that connect to the community to make sure the daycares can come in, uh, daycare kids can come in and use the space that they want to see, or the main street can access uh, businesses and 
uh, housing and all the other things that are in the surrounding area. So really it's that connection to community. And then that also provides access to amenities in the park, like the stage, like the pavilion. It offers programming opportunities in all seasons. So you can see the oval um, can be flooded and become a skating rink uh, experience in the winter. In the summer, fall months, even winter months, there's a little pavilion for music concerts and other things. So environment, this is really the natural space that reciprocally affects humans, plants, animals, really everything in the space. So we are blessed to have so much diversity here from deserts to prairies to forests, lakes and rivers. Our park spaces or green spaces can be so unique, but also provide unique challenges for each biome. So thinking about uh, those things, considerations might be a park has the opportunity to improve habitat diversity. Topography can be celebrated and it can create unique options, whether it's a mountain biking experience, cross country ski experience, or even a nature play experience. A maintenance plan is still key to support plant establishment because a lot of things within parks are living things and they need to be cared for. Um, and if they're planted and, and, and done properly, uh, especially with native species, they can withstand our climate and, and the changes that they will likely experience. So this is another project in Senegath, Manitoba. And here it is really a space to celebrate the river, people coming together. Uh, but there's also constraints here. So flooding is, is an extreme reality in this river-based uh, community. So thinking about what kind of elements can go within the space and withstand some of the onslaught of the rising river. Um, so playing with sculpture gardens, narrowing pathways, weaving through gardens, uh, having more naturalized areas that can withstand fluctuations in temperature and do a lot of upland shade plantings to hopefully avoid the onslaught of the river as well as introduce interpretation, signage, visual interest and artwork to really create these focal pieces as you move through the space. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jane for the next point. I'm gonna have a little sip of water here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Darcy. Knowing uh, what we have to work with in Manitoba for those physical design considerations, we can now consider activation considerations, namely programming and art, recreation, tourism, and commerce. Our first activation consideration is programming and art. Here we're referring to facilitated events and site features that celebrate and commemorate or inform and entertain. Programmed events will encourage visitors to come to the site in a regulated manner. Events such as concerts, sports tournaments, outdoor education, and theater performances, they require different levels of facilitative space and they'll draw different demographics. So artistic work can be wo uh, woven into the landscape and celebrate culture or infuse intrigue. Social media publicity and advertising will be necessary for the success of any programming that takes place on site. And it's a great way to promote new artwork in the park. This can be worked into the park in a practical way by creating annual traditions that people rely on for entertainment. A park can become known for offering one type of programming or one distinctive art feature, or it can be adaptive. Larger and smaller events throughout the year and changing art exhibits could be a possibility. We would invite you to think about a special outdoor space that you visited for an event or to experience art that you had heard about from a friend or on social media. If you can think of a location or an event that fits that criteria, you could add it to the chat. Uh, shown here, we have a few examples of event parks and public art in Manitoba that strongly highlight how programming in a park brings a community together. 
As you move forward into envisioning what your park could host, we would encourage you to remember that catering to a wide age range and investing money in your community's assets will bring you more economic opportunities through tourism and commerce and overall just an improved quality of life for locals who visit the park. Recreation is our next activation consideration. This refers to the realm of living passively and actively outside of work. As stated, recreation is the realm of life that's outside of work. So this can be passive, meaning non-consumptive activities that do not require programmed space, such as simply sitting outside or cycling, or active, uh, which means structured physical activity that does require a facility to operate. So that could be hockey or volleyball, something like that. We would encourage anyone pursuing park improvements to consider making room for both programmed activities and free space as well as creating accessibility in something as simple as your walking paths to allow for all levels of physical activity to participate in recreation. Event planning uh, can be a part of recreation as well, uh, creating seasonal or annual sporting events that bring a new crowd to your parks. Here we have examples once again from across Manitoba that range from large group activities to an individual experience and recreation that considers all seasons and all levels of ability. So we can include things in your parks like yoga, volleyball, hockey, cross-country skiing, and then walking trails. Recreation might also include places for people to interact with their pets. So something like a dog park can also fall into the realm of activation. Here we have tourism considerations, simply referring to providing amenities for visitors beyond the local population. When accommodating tourism, we consider the demographics of people coming in to visit our communities and that they need maybe local from Manitoba, coming from across Canada, or coming from out of the country altogether. Regardless of background, amenities offered to visitors should account for the various circumstances that'll bring people to site, including uh, rest, recreation, business, and education. Addressing these needs encourages a steady flow of satisfied tourists and in turn, a steady flow of revenue for the community. In terms of specific site features, you might consider adding a visitor wall for documentation or changing exhibits so that the tourist experience is always fresh. Parks should accommodate various modes of transportation from tour buses to walking tours. And most of all, all these elements need to come together to cultivate an identity for the park, something that's unique from existing destinations. That's basically a reason for people to visit your park instead of others. Here we have the St. Agath Park design again. Um, in this case, we're highlighting how enhanced amenities such as fishing spots, public washrooms, and uh, small watercraft storage all encourage visitors to linger and enjoy the space. So um, it's adjacent to the river and offers boat access for the public. And this does include the local community and the tourist community. The final activation consideration has been roughly discussed in all the others, and that is commerce. Commerce in this context is referring to businesses within a park setting that offer consumable and or durable goods to the public. While commerce refers here to the goods and services offered on site, it's also good to consider park adjacency when looking to open new amenities in your community. Having a visual connection between a restaurant or a market to a green space is great to guide visitors from one well-curated space to another. Commerce in a park may be temporary markets or permanent structures, such as a washroom facility or uh, with amenities. Businesses chosen to operate within a park will have a direct impact on the impression that the site gives to visitors and the type of visitors that are drawn to the site. Park integration is a wonderful way to support local businesses um, and it doesn't have to be a permanent feature. It, you can create space for rotating storefronts or seasonal markets, and that would bring a diversity of experience to the space, creating a sustainable tourism interest. So there's always something new. It's also important to consider both consumable goods like a food stand or truck and durable goods like physical souvenirs. Commerce ideally will not overwhelm the park, but add an enhancing layer of experience and the opportunity for visitors to bring home a physical memory. Here are some examples of commerce activities and events that support programming, recreation, and tourism. 
We have seasonal events like Festival de Voyageur. We have amenities that take advantage of the local landscape like boat tours, skating, and campgrounds. As we mentioned, a restaurant on site is a common source for commerce. And more expensive amenities like a wedding venue can also be a possible add to your park. From this point on, we want to take you uh, from the elements that we've discussed and consider how they relate to the individual experience. Each site that we design is unique and comes with unique opportunities and challenges, but there are some consistent elements that we can consider right from the beginning that will help us create a beautiful and functional space. Jane, I just wanted to pause you there. Um, we did not get anybody uh, participating with any park spaces that um, you might find unique or special. So I would encourage you if you have any to share to add them to the chat, uh, because especially as we're delving into these individual experiences, it's nice to have sort of something in your mind, a framework piece that uh, you've had an individual experience at so that you can reflect on that. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, yeah, hopefully this next little bit will help you if you can't come up with a, an experience that you've had, this will maybe inspire one. So uh, this infographic that you see here comes from the Project for Public Spaces Collective. According to that collective, a great place, something we consider a great place, should have an even distribution of experiences and opportunities that fall into one of four key attributes. Uh, that's represented by the innermost circle here. So those four attributes are sociability, uses and activities, access and linkages, and comfort and image. The second circle represents the intangibles, which is how a place makes us feel, if it's friendly, comfortable, sustainable, etc. The outer circle represents the measurements. This is how those intangible feelings can be quantified. So uh, your um, analysis might be that this space excels in access and linkages because it feels connected. And the reason it feels connected are because there are proper transit connections. These categories can be used as a tool during community consultations to understand where your place of interest already excels and in what ways it needs to improve. The first key attribute is uses and activities. The key question here is whether visitors are drawn to participate in diverse activities in this place. Prompting thoughts to answer this question might include, is this place used by people of different ages? Can the place be used for more than one type of activity? And which parts of the space are used and which are not? The second key attribute is sociability, which addresses whether people return off into this place to gather and socialize. So ask yourself, is this a place where you would choose to meet your friends and family? Are other groups meeting here? Are people in the space talking with one another? And do large numbers of people use this space frequently? The third key attribute is comfort and images. Whether people feel safe in this place and whether this place adds to its surroundings in a way that is visually pleasant. Prompting questions to better analyze a place's comfort and image include, does this place make a good first impression? Are there enough places to sit? Do people have a choice of places to sit, such as in the sun or the shade? And finally, something we've discussed, does the area feel safe? The fourth and final attribute is access and linkages. This attribute is particularly relevant when considering green space connections beyond your park. Even within the space, you can address whether all people can reach different areas easily and how well it is connected to other spaces with prompt questions such as, uh, is there a good connection between this place and adjacent buildings and the community? Does the space function well for people with disabilities and other special needs, such as strollers or mobility devices? And do the paths throughout the space take people where they actually want to go? We have uh, one more way of analyzing the individual experience. It's another infographic from the Project for Public Space Collective. This will uh, assess park spaces from scales that range from a large regional park like the Pimachio and Aki um, space that Darcy had mentioned, the Manitoba UNESCO World Heritage Site, 
or down to a place as small as a pocket park. So um, this is called the power of 10 rule. And it states that each distinct space should offer 10 distinct experiences. These 10 experience opportunities might include a place to sit, play structures to climb, art to view, or history to experience. Some of these activities will be unique to this particular place, reflecting the culture and the history of the surrounding community. Local residents who use the space most uh, will be the best source of ideas for which experiences ex exist and which are missing. So again, before we move on, um, have any of these slides sort of made you think or inspired you to connect uh, to a space that you've been considering? I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but I'm just curious. <laughs> Are you asking like what spaces we've been working in and like, yeah. Yeah, you can choose your own park spaces um, that you're working in or some place inspiring that you enjoy to visit. Okay. Uh, we're working in Le, Le Parc uh, La Vérandrie in St. Boniface and trying to kind of like refurbish it and, and um, sort of add some elements, make it more accessible and more, uh, safer, I guess. So it's nice, nice to get all of this info because it's definitely sparking some ideas um, and making me think about the different elements that we already have and that we should add. So it's good. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Yeah. So having that inventory of things that you already have to celebrate, it's not, it's never a starting from zero point because every place has something special. And I also see Michelle from uh, Alexander, the RM of Alexander, said Broken Head Wetland Interpretive Trail is a great example. It is a really nice space. I love how there's accessible trails, there's washroom amenities, there's enough parking access from the highway, uh, there is garbage receptacles, as well as there's an experience, right? So you can go on this journey through the bog, through the forest, um, and open up into the meadow where there's all these native orchids. So it's a unique uh, experience that really changes over the season. I've seen it in spring. It feels very different than in the fall when you have the golden colors of all the grasses and the tamaracks blaring. So it is a really, really unique space. So thank you for sharing, Michelle. Leslie's got one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just um, I just wanted to highlight. I know I had worked on a project a couple of years ago with the Crowing Trail Association, and uh, developing a segment of the trail between Saint Pierre and Saint Malo, twenty five kilometer section, if you will, um, branded as the Camino. And one of the things that was super important because of the distance was placing benches at every five kilometers. So even though it's not an isolated park per se, I think these concepts and you're just you're, like all the information is just like my mind's like boom, 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 <laughs> all these ideas. But I think they're very practical as well to like a trail system, right? Like, so even though we are calling this enhancing your parks, there's principles in here that I think, you know, gives me such an appreciation for the landscape architecture discipline because there's these principles that I think you can cross over um, as well. Yeah, very good point. Any kind of green space, river corridor, like I think there's so many, so many opportunities and um, crowing is a great example. It is a very long distance and through not only programming, like through that passport thing. So, so neat. It really encourages tourism. It gets people to be connected to Spain in some, you know, strange way as you're building these connections through trail and through the landscape. So good point. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing. Anyone else want it, willing or wanting to share? I have one more thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just something that you really hit the nail on the head with 
um, is giving us a lot of things to consider because at, for tourism, at the end of the day, tourists want to feel comfortable, right? If tourists are comfortable, then they can do all the other things like learn something new, uh, connect with a local, develop friendships, whatever, right? But as soon as someone is uncomfortable, it doesn't matter how great of a product or an attraction you have. If they're uncomfortable, it, they're not gonna engage the best they can with it. So these principles, I think also help build that level of comfort. So how do we take our parks from just a park being a park for local residents to being a park that can cater to tourists? So that was really good. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing. There's one question in the chat um, about oh, thanks. Um, human psychology, if there are specific rules to make a space feel safe. Um, I do recall one that would kind of relate to benches and that would be trying to locate anywhere that you would um, sit and stay so that you have something um, at your back and that the majority of your view is like very expansive. So you feel that you're uh, sitting and nothing is like coming up behind you. That can be kind of like a yeah, that's definitely a psychology of having a vantage point with some sort of like safe backing. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the visuals, the view sheds, all those things that you're opening up to are, are really critical for feeling safe. Um, even lighting, like thinking about nighttime use of parks. And I know, Leslie, as you were talking, I was, my brain was just thinking about like traveling in Europe and going to a new place that you've never been to and kind of feeling that sense of like, ooh, this seems a little sketchy, not feeling safe here. So I think all of us have had those alarms go off. So how do we, um, like you said, use the human psychology, that social being that we all are uh, to make, make safety a priority. And it's really, you know, being well lit, being well used, actually seeing people in a space um, does have a psychological benefit of, of comfort. Um, so I guess all those things are, are really neat ways to delve into. You also, I would say, um, could use signage to feel safer, because I know if you're out in public, you're on your phone trying to figure out where you're going, you feel a little bit vulnerable and you look like a tourist as well. So to have signage that's just sending you where you need to go, you can walk with more confidence if you're traveling at night. Yeah, good point. And I also see one more comment. Um, there are so many parks in the Eastern region, the power of 10 rule would be great to address, especially the community parks. This would help encourage locals and visitors to use them. Send them our way, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Um, it, it, it really is, parks are such a special uh, special place in communities and it, it is really something special to, to celebrate. And whether, like I said, you're the mindset of somebody that's living in the community and using a park or a tourist going to a new space and exploring, where do you wanna go? Are you going to those botanical bar gardens, the, the neat uh, parks that, that are out there, the markets and, and really living and experiencing those spaces and enjoying those spaces. So thank you very much for sharing. All right, well, that is, uh, um, what we have for today's webinar. So we really hope that the webinar has left you with some wanderlust, <laughs> whether it's to explore your local neighborhood parks or the larger regional attractions. Manitoba has so much to offer in all seasons. And with these new metrics we've discussed for evaluating successful places, you can now become the agents to engage with community, the you know, agents of change in the community activating new ideas and really um, filling in the holes where things are maybe falling a little short. So we hope this inspire you, inspires you to start planning improvement structures with the best practices for successful park design. Really, I think the mental and physical wellness of our community truly depends on these open spaces. 
and I'm not going to echo this, but like during the pandemic, I feel like that has certainly been amplified, has been highlighted. Um, the demand for these spaces, whether it's trails or parks, really was intensified. So having access to nature, having these green spaces, park spaces is a true asset to every community. So please go forth and celebrate, promote them and program in these spaces. And I also wanted to do one last plug. I hope to see some of, uh, or some or all of your faces in person. We wanted to invite you to join us June 15th and 16th for some community walkabouts. So this will give us an opportunity to actually explore spaces, experience the park spaces in person. Uh, we'll be leading you through park spaces, allowing you to evaluate your experience in green space firsthand. So just wear comfortable footwear, dress for the elements. Hopefully it won't be rain slickers. No, just kidding. Uh, but there is a rain date for June 17th if this inclement weather continues to um, uh, be persistent. Uh, and we would encourage you to participate in all the park spaces from a, a big diversity of French communities around Manitoba. So I will leave you with our socials. My email address is at the very bottom. If there's any questions, um, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm always love to talk um, park spaces, trails, development. So uh, if there's anything that maybe I didn't answer in this webinar or Jane and I didn't address, feel free to send your questions or simply follow us on socials on our little park adventures uh, in landscape architecture. And I wanted to say thank you again. Merci à tout le monde. Uh, and open it up for any questions that you may have. Thank you pretty much answered all of my questions, but I just wanted to say thank you to both of you. It was a really wonderful presentation. The speaking speed was perfect and it hit on like all of the information that I was hoping for. So great job. Thanks very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, Darcy and Jane. I just wanted also to extend an invitation to everyone who attended this webinar today. You are more than welcome to join us on one, two, three, or all four walkabouts that we are doing. Um, we tried to select um, some park spaces in four different communities, tried to hit one in sort of each sub-region, if you will, um, so that it makes it as accessible as possible. Um, there's no cost to these walkabouts. They'll be about an hour and a half long, um, all in, and it will allow you as one, a visitor, but two, as a reviewer to see um, elements that we've talked about today with real life examples. So um, it, this is a very, hopefully will be a very educational, but also a very practical experience for anyone who is looking at your parks as an asset, or you're thinking about investing in your park infrastructure, either park planning, pre two or the infrastructure. So um, with that, if you know of anyone who didn't attend today, but you think this information would be good for them, please feel free to share it. The recording um, will be available on the SEDEM website. And um, please encourage people to watch it before the walkabout. Um, that, I think that would be helpful. And I just wanted to say thanks again to everyone for attending. And thank you, Darcy and Jane. And now I'll, I'll leave it. I'll be quiet now so folks can ask any more questions. <laughs> Is there a sign up for the walkabout?